Good Thursday, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com Mailbag Podcast presented by our good friends at Blue Water Climate Control. As we've been talking about, they want to say thank you to you uh, for their a point of their appreciation for you guys, for um, your support of, of their business and all that they do. So if you need a good, if you need a service repair, you need somebody to come out and just look at your system and give you an evaluation, they can do it for you at Blue Water Climate Control. You can book your appointment online at bluewaterclimatecontrol.com or you can give them a call at 865-299-2290 and uh, have them come out and evaluate things, look things over. And if you do have to have a repair, um, you want them to do it because they're going to do it the right way the first time. Uh, they're, they're not going to take multiple times to get it fixed. They're going to do the right repair the right way. That's at Blue Water Climate Control. With Austin Price, Rob Lewis, and Brent Hubbs, plenty to get to here in this mailbag edition of the podcast as we take your questions um, and just jump right into them here. And the first one is up for Rob Lewis here on the hoops front. Rob, this guy wants to know, um, Beef wants to know about uh, Kennedy Chandler's jump shot. How good of a jump shot? Where is he from a perimeter scoring standpoint? Good, solid. I mean, not a great you – know, I, I don't expect him to shoot, you know, 42% next year, but he is definitely uh, capable of, of knocking down that shot, to, certainly to the point where you you have to respect it, you have to guard him. I would guess he'll 35 36% shooter, but he is not at all a guy who you can lay off and, you know, try to cut down dribble penetration. I mean, he's he shoots it well enough to, to bring everything else – into play as far as being able to get past guys on the dribble who have to come, come up and, um, you know, make sure that he doesn't have open looks. Again, not great, not, not lights out, but good, good enough. This probably goes hand in hand, but what's, what's the greater benefit? His ability to get to the rim gives him open looks and makes him a better three point shooter. Or the fact that you've got to respect his three point shot gives him the ability to have an easier path to the rim and, and create. I think it's because you have to respect him. I think that's the bigger deal because, um, man, in, in talking, I, I know one thing that, that Rick Barnes loves about him, and um, he calls him a tough layup maker. I mean, even, even though he's just six, six foot, six one, 175 pounds, he is an elite finisher at the rim just with his ability to contort his body, to, to finish with either hand, to just really, for a kid his size, his ability to finish in traffic at the rim is special. And, and, and he can get in there a lot because you have to guard him out front. All right, so let me ask this, too. Um, there's talk, and, and there's, uh, again, another push to move the three-point line uh, to the international line. You for that, or are you against that in the college game? Uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of ambivalent. I mean, I can see it both both ways. I mean, I don't think that you really saw them, them moving it back to where they did, you know, really have a huge impact on percentages. I don't know what, exactly what the number is, but I know it's not dramatic. Uh, the gap so I mean I wouldn't have a huge problem with, with with it either way but I also I wouldn't wouldn't advocate for it but I could see why some coaches want to do that to open things up even more but it's not going to it's not going to defer deter anybody from shooting a three-point no. shot I mean, that's, I mean, that's for sure and a lot of these kids anyway want to show that they have NBA range so they're not they're not toeing the line I mean they're looking to show that they can make it from you know a foot and a half two feet behind the line yeah, certainly. And I mean, they, and in the gym and practice, they're shooting NBA three pointers. They're not shooting college level three pointers when they're in the, in the gym, getting their shots up. So uh, that, that's something to keep uh, an eye on uh, with a possible rule change. We'll see if that happens. You think the six, the six foul rule is going to go in? I don't know, but I hope it does. I mean, I really, I, I, I dislike, you know, kids, you know, if you pick up a cheap one, like, like you see so often and then suddenly you're, you're playing eight minutes in the first half. And I think that has a big impact on, on the game. It just, you know, I think it takes a little pressure off officials. You need to be perfect. Yeah. It allows Doug Shells and Teddy Valentine to do their thing and be at the center of attention and, and, and the kids don't foul out. I would, I would, I would be in favor of them going six fouls personally. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I really d- dislike it when a kid is, is limited from by foul trouble. I mean, because so, so often, you know, when it's a, a ticky tack kind of thing. Yeah, I do not. I do not like the proposed rule. I'm not a big fan of the proposed rule for a technical foul for a flop. Um, and the reason I don't like that is how do you judge that? And if you're going to put a technical foul on that, how many times are we going to go to the monitor to determine whether That's- it's a flop? Or, or, or it was a legitimate foul. I just think it's going to cause so much stoppage in the game 
And I think the game's got too much of that going on right now. So I'm not yeah, a fan. Uh, of I'm the same. Anything, anything that is going to lead to more monitor reviews, I'm against. Yeah. I mean, just p- penalize the flopper by letting play continue. And you've got a guy laying on the ground and, and somebody could, you know, a prone defender that's out of the play. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I don't like the whole notion of turning that. I, I mean, I get you're trying to eliminate, you know, flopping and faking fouls, but I, I just the only way you're going to prove that that's the case is you're going to have to go to review it. I just don't think we need any more of those in the game. All right, Austin, let's go to, to you on this football recruiting question. How hard are the Vols recruiting Anthony Brown and Jalen Lewis, even though they didn't make Jalen Lewis's top 10? And how much of a factor is the loss of Coach Clink scale for Tennessee's chances of trying to flip the Wade twins? Well, I think that the, the, we'll start with the second part first. I do think that the loss of clink scale is a big deal. Now, is it the end all be all? No, but does it open the door a little bit for Tennessee to potentially kind of push their way in there? Yes, I think so. I a hundred percent think that's the case. Um, now with the other two, Tennessee has recruited Jalen Lewis harder than Anthony Brown, but has only recruited Jalen Lewis hard the last three to four weeks before that. They weren't recruiting either one of them very hard. So, you know, it, 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 that's one of those things where, like, I, you know, I continue to say, like, Tennessee's got to make their mind up on Jalen Lewis and Anthony Brown. You have to be either in the pool or out of the pool. Having your feet in doesn't do you any good. So, like, you know, if you're not going to go for them, then, then, then don't go for them. Just understand that they're going to take official visits to places like Oklahoma and Oregon and Miami and places like that. Um, you know, but if you're going to go for them, then go all in. And so I think Tennessee right now is in the process of the all in. Um, they're going to come here and camp June 1st. And, uh, you know, if, if they, if they actually work out and just don't come and stand around and look pretty, then, you know, I think you'll have a real, if you're Tennessee, you'll have a real good idea of what you got in both those kids and whether to go full bore from here on out or not. Why do you think this clink scale thing opens the door? Because we, we heard when the Wade committed Austin, there was, <clears throat> You know, they were concerned. There, there was a notion they were concerned about Tennessee's punishment with the NCAA. And then we know there was so much talk about, um, about you know, getting to play the quarterback position and, and being recruited as a quarterback. So what leads you to believe that, that the factor there would, would crack the door? I'm not saying that they're going to – I'm not suggesting that Tennessee can flip them. But why do you think that that – is it just – is their relationship with Clint Scale that good? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, you know, he 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 spent a lot of time in this state. Has really worked it kind of hard for Kentucky, and um, you know they 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 liked him a lot. I think that you know Clink Scale really developed a nice bond, not only with the boys but also their mom. And so you know, I, I think him going elsewhere. I mean, obviously that would open the door for them to potentially look at Michigan and Michigan to recruit them harder. I mean, Michigan's already got Cody Jones committed um, in the state. And so, uh, you know, but at the same time, I'm not sure they want to go that far away from home. Mm-hmm. And so, Agreed. you know, I, I do believe that it opens the door for Tennessee some somewhat to at least make a run at them. Okay. Um, any prospects in the Tri-Cities that could be viewed um, as a 22, 23, or 24 Division One or Power 5 prospect? Football, I, not to my knowledge. I mean, Kid Elizabethan's pretty good. Um, I think there's a kid at Greenville that could be uh, – there's a younger kid that could be pretty good. Um, but as far as, like, you know, I, I think you won't know that for, you know, those kids come to camp, that type of thing. The kid at Elizabeth, and I don't think so, you know, an SEC-type player. He's just really, really, really good football player. So, um, you know, I, I don't, I'm not sure that anybody up that way will be a Power 5 kid the next couple of years. Um, but ultimately, if you're kind of one of those tweener kids, you got to come to camp and show what you got and – and then, you know, one or two of those power pop schools fall, and then, you know, it's it's all a copycat. So a lot of the other schools will jump in after you as well. Yep, camp will be important for some of those kids because, you know, again, as we've talked about, Rob, those kids haven't been seen. So, you know, what does a guy look like in, in a camp deal this year, next year, just because guys have not been evaluated? Speaking yeah, of – I mean, go ahead. I was just going to say, we've, we've talked about it before. I think you'll see more dramatic swings in, in, in the – you know, rival, not just rivals ratings, but everybody's ratings and, and coaches evaluations of kids that, you know, just because they're, they're four stars now, 
fans, you know, get all up in arms about. I mean, those some of those four star kids, maybe two star kids by October, and yeah. and some two star kids, maybe four star kids. Yep, I think that's what's going to make June really, really fascinating because I think Austin, there's going to be a lot of buzz on kids in, in a lot of different directions coming out of the month of June because kids are going to be at so many different places and be in front of so many people, um, you know, trying to prove themselves and do so much that it's going to make it really fascinating uh, to kind of see where um, the thought process is on some kids at the end of June compared to where it was heading into the start of June with camp season. Oh, 100% agree. I, I, it's going to be wild to kind of watch the, you know, again, you're going to inevitably have some kids that, you know, there, there'll be some kids that come to Tennessee that can't, you know, that camp well here, that Tennessee, you know, goes hard in on. And because Tennessee does, schools X, Y, and Z will as well without ever having seen them and vice versa. There'll be kids that go somewhere else first that do well that, you know, Tennessee will be forced to decide, hey, are we going all in on this kid? Because, you know, we hadn't offered or or we hadn't really went hard, and yet here he went and has apparently done really well at so-and-so's camp. I mean, uh, that that's going to be, you know, it always goes on, but I think this year especially is going to be a different dynamic than we probably have ever seen across, you know, college football uh, with, with that type of thing because I think that, you know, nobody's going to want to get left behind on a prospect just because, you know, kids can change, their bodies can change. I mean, you go and look and look at the Nathan Robinson kid hubs from the point, you know, that you and I interviewed, you know, from the point that he played last season to the point you interviewed him, you know, a couple of weeks ago, he added a couple of inches and 30 pounds. I mean, that's a dramatic difference yeah. in just a few months. Yeah. So, I mean, like, you're going to have a lot of that, I think. Yeah, yeah I don't... It, that's, that's not uncommon when you go from a 15-year-old to a 17-year-old. Yeah, or you go in it, and in that kid's case, you go from, from fourteen four to fifteen year old to, to fifteen years old because he he was very much in the growth window there as a young kid. But you're exactly right, Rob. I mean, it's not uncommon for a, a dramatic change in six months or five months the the way that that you know when a kid just matures. Um, all right, so Bruce Vall wants to. Know, I want to make sure everybody understands. This is Bruce Vall. Uh, he wants to know how Markel Fortenberry's recruitment is going. Here, there's a connection with with Dad. Um, I think Mar I think Markel is, is obviously and I'm happy for for Paul and Markel and, and the whole Fortenberry family. He's gonna have an opportunity to play college football at a variety of places. He offers are rolling in. I don't think dad deserves a lot of credit for Markel's development, Rob. I mean, <laughs> no. Are you gonna give Paul I mean no. listen, front I mean front pocket Paul, I mean I know he's got a pretty good jumper, but I, I mean, mean you know, and, and I know Markel's fortunate that he's not the best soccer player at Maryville right now. <laughs> that's that's my biggest surprise is that he's not the best soccer player in Maryville yeah <laughs> Paul's love affair for soccer is, is pretty intense but I I'm not going to give Paul a ton of credit for for Markel's development there um, although I will say this Markel's probably had to make a lot of tough catches uh, because his dad's thrown in the ball some you know because we've seen we've seen Paul throw it and um it can be all over the map, all over the map with that, but wrong uh, way for it. Very, <laughs> it is fun to see, you know, it, it is fun to see them go through this process. I've talked to Paul some, and uh, it's just kind of wild, you know, some of the conversations that he's having and Markel's having with people that, you know, he he's covered in a variety of different ways and uh, to go be, you know, at a camp somewhere, instead of covering the camp, you're, you're watching, you're watching your kid at a camp. So I know it's been a fun experience for them and, obviously going to make for an interesting June for him as well. Cause his stock does, does continue to rise among a lot of schools out there. I was going to say, I'm going to get, I'm going to work at a quick Paul Fortenberry story since we don't have, it's kind of a light mail bag. There, there are a lot of good Paul Fortenberry stories, but my, probably my favorite is as we were leaving Oklahoma city to, to we had flown into Tulsa. So we're driving, this is after Tennessee played Oklahoma. We're driving from Oklahoma city to Tulsa to catch our flight on a Sunday morning. We're in the car for about 30 or 45 minutes. And I see a sign that says Wichita X amount of miles. <laughs> and Paul's driving, by the way. And Fortenberry has gotten on the interstate going north instead of south. And we didn't and turned around. I made him pull over and I drove and we we did about 90 miles an hour and barely caught the plane. And a stunning shocked, develop shocked, and a stunning development, Rob you were fast. <laughs> But hey, wrong, that, way, wrong way, Fortenberry. But that's the same guy. I mean, he found you good Mexican, a good Mexican restaurant on that trip, he right did. in the gas station. 
it was a gas station slash Mexican restaurant that you had found on Yelp. So I'll yeah, props to that. Which which she wants to talk about instead of getting on the interstate going the wrong way. All right, on to Justin Dillard here, who wants to know is Tennessee recruiting Taylor Groves. He posted his recruitment is wide open. Also, do we get any commitments from now till the end of June? If so, how many do you think? Jump on in there. Oh, Jump on in there, AP. <laughs> Your favorite Lord. question. Um, Give me a number. Give me an over and under. Not, not really recruiting two, two Taylor Groves. Over under. Not, not really recruiting Taylor Groves. And uh, commitments in the month of June, I'll go over one and a half. Well, if they're bringing in 30 kids on official visits like you're calling for, they better be over one and a half. One and a half. Yeah, I'm going to take the over at one and a half. I, I think I'll take I think I'll take the over there, but not by much. I mean, because I, I think they're going to bring a lot of kids in to get their attention, but I think a lot of kids are going to wait and see what this team looks like in the fall. It, it's amazing to me, Brent, though, just like – I mean, like once they kind of, you know, you know, broke the ice with Elijah Herring and then followed that up with Vincent Sneed, just, just the – I guess just kind of the the notion, the the feeling that, that this program has right now versus when they were sitting there getting shut out. It's too generally – I mean, I know they've only got four, but, I mean, when you factor in that they've got a four-star quarterback that's kind of a marquee piece and something to build around, an in-state kid that this has ties, like, it, it, yeah, it just feels like a different vibe. Plus, you throw all the transfers in on top Mm -hmm. of the four high school kids and it just it feels like they have a little bit of juice like you know they had zero juice and now it feels like they've got a little bit and well, uh it just is a different vibe and consider this i mean i mean recruiting in may and june is is fool's gold as far as trying to judge you know the direction of your program because i mean just think about it we're about a year one year anniversary away from where everybody thought you know tennessee was back baby they're rattling off, you know, commitments for, in a two-week stretch that had the fan base more fired up than they had been in a long, long time about recruiting. And now, you know, look look where that ended up. Yeah, and 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 recruiting is so much about perception. I mean, it, it's just you, you know because it's copycat deal, and and you get on a hot run, and and you get things going, and you know that's how teams get on a run. It's so much about perception out there, and. Uh, I agree with you, Austin. I mean, the perception a month ago was that Tennessee had no traction with anybody. They weren't really going anywhere. And now the perception is it's it's not that suddenly they, they don't have enough numbers for everybody. It's not that kind of perception. But the perception is there are a lot more people interested in Tennessee, and, and, and Tennessee's got a better shot at some people um, around the country than anybody was giving them credit for a month ago. Um, and I don't know that relationships have changed that dramatically with some of those kids in, in the last month. It's just the vibe that you get from the standpoint of, you know, once you get a couple of commits in the boat, everybody starts talking about you and it changes it in a total different direction. It's, it's crazy how perception changes everything. And I think Jackson's huge, huge yeah. quarterback. I mean, quarterback's an attention getter. There's, there's no doubt about that. I mean, it, it, it grabs people's attention. Kids, well, take especially care. when he, especially when he did it without having been here, without mm -hmm. having set foot on campus and spent time around the staff. Like to me, that that that's that was the most shocking thing about. It's not. It was not shocking that he picked Tennessee, but to do it before coming here for a visit during the pandemic when he's really not been on a lot of schools or anything. That was the most shocking part of it. That means he felt comfortable enough with this group having built some solid relationships through zoom and phone calls to uh, pull the trigger. And nothing says belief in an offense more than a quarterback saying, I want to come play for you. No, nothing in the world says that. Speaking of quarterback, quarterback with a lot of options. Yeah. Speaking of quarterbacks, so we got a question about quarterbacks and uh, any theories as to why the state preview produces so few quarterbacks. And do you see that changing now that Trent Diffler is at Lipscomb with his obvious ties to the NFL, as well as the elite 11. I mean, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they went from they went, you know, Ty was kind of that first one and, and, and broke through the, you know, the ceiling. And now they've got, you know, two or three quarterbacks in that 23 class. They had the one kid transfer in from Texas. It's going to be at Ravenwood. They got obviously Marcel Reed at the NBA. There's a kid out of Memphis. Um, you know, so yeah, they, they're starting to produce more. I think part of its coaching's gotten better. Offensive style has changed. I mean, you know, um, everybody knows I love Kevin Creasy at Oakland. He's my guy, but 
you know, it ain't like he's, you know, out there, you know, setting the world on fire with his offense. He's just, you know, defense, running game, and just out athleting people. Um, you know, so you just don't see it. You know, a ton of the best programs have really great, you know, quarterbacks because they, you know, their offenses they run aren't, you know, maybe conducive to that. But I think you're starting to see more and more, and 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 the the quarterback coaching in in state is is a little bit better than it once was. Trent Delford definitely helps with that. He's got a pretty good little solid signal caller of himself and, and then another young kid that he'll be grooming after that. Yeah, his his senior signal caller will play at the – I mean, he, he's going to play Cincinnati or, or somewhere like that at least, maybe more, maybe higher. But I think Cincinnati, which there's nothing wrong with Cincinnati. I mean, I, I think Cincinnati's a, a, a very realistic option for him. I think, Rob, the other thing too is – you're seeing the product of kids being groomed to be quarterbacks. Whereas, you know, for the, for many years, it was just put your best athlete at quarterback because of the style of offense, as, as Austin mentioned. But we've seen over the course of the last, particularly five or six years, all the specialized training. And so some of these was, guys was... are just being groomed a, as quarterbacks. And that wasn't the case several years ago. Yeah, and I was going to add the prol- proliferation of seven-on-seven seven stuff that makes it more – you know, you're working at being a quarterback more year round than you, you were in the past. I mean, I think there's, you know, there's not, you know, kids take some time off here and there, but there's not like a, a lengthy off season. I mean, they are, they're working at their craft on more of a year round basis than they were even 10 years ago. I agree with that too. All right. Uh, KH Vols wants to says he was sitting behind Walker Merrill's mom and dad and brother during the orange and white game. Once I realized who they were, we started talking about football Walker's brother is in the eighth grade now, and they say he's a better football player than Walker was at that age. Do you guys know anything about him? Austin, you know anything about Walker Merrill's brother? I, I don't I, I don't know a lot about him. I know nothing about him. Yeah, hey, nothing hey, at all. You and don't again, have your finger on the pulse of eighth grade football in the Mid-State? I'm 95, baby. I, I don't know the uh, – the, uh, I don't know the, the – 440 or 840 corridor like Paul would. <laughs> yeah, I, the I, I four corridor. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know a whole lot about him. I know that if he's a receiver, the offense he's playing in, he's not going to get a ton of touches. And I think, I think for Walker Merrill, it was about, it was about camps and and his some of his seven on seven work and and things that that helped him get Tennessee's attention because he's not a guy who got a ton of touches, you know, in high school because of the offense that they played in. So. Uh, I'll do some checking and see there, but I, no, I'm with Austin. I don't know anything about that, uh, really anything about him. Uh, since Coach, he- Coach Heupel's tempo offense doesn't sub often to keep the rest from letting the defense sub, how will the rotations go? How many receivers, running backs, do you see getting reps per game? Looks like at UCF, just four wide receivers and two running backs got the bulk of the playing time. Uh, who decides who is playing each possession, Heupel or the position coach? Look, the position coach is going to be the, the one, uh, unless – you know, typically is going to be the one who's deciding to, to start a possession unless Coach Heupel wants something specific or, or Coach Golish wants something specific. In order to keep that rotation small, you better be making first downs because if you're not making first downs and you're not moving to change, then you're not getting your up-tempo offense going the way that you want it, want it to go. So uh, I think, you know, in terms of getting reps per game, I mean, that depends on offensive, you know, making first downs. If you're going up-tempo, Rob, and – you're in a 10 play drive and, and you got a defense on your heels. You're not going to see rotations during that 10 play drive. If you can help it. I mean, it's just not, I mean, they're not. Um, but at the same time too, if you're going three and out, you're going to see a lot more rotations because tempo doesn't work if you don't make first downs. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I think it's going to be fascinating to see how it all plays out. I mean, is the offense going to be good enough to, you know, just simply make first downs and put pressure on the opposing defense and protect their own defense so that they're not, I mean, early in the season, that's going to be, I think, by, by far, the the most interesting thing to watch. I mean, can the, it's almost to me like the offense is going to have to protect the defense. I mean, I think we all agree there's more established playmakers, the offense, more veterans on the offensive line, running back look, looks like they have some weapons, and the defense has got a lot of question marks. I mean, can the can the offense protect the defense? Can they avoid, you know, those three and outs where you take 23 seconds off the clock after you had two incompletions. Can they, you know, go 10, 12 plays and use up tempo to their advantage or is up tempo going to be to their disadvantage? 
I mean, I don't, I don't think we know the answer to that. No, nope, we got to move. We got to move the chains for for it to be an advantage. But Austin, I mean, I mean, they're going to rotate guys, but but I don't think that. I, I think again, it's going to be dictated by how how high how up tempo they can they can run, um, more so than it is. Hey, we got to get this guy X number of snaps, that guy X number of snaps. Yeah, I mean, it's like the offensive line. I mean, you, you're gonna you're gonna have, you know, you, you're gonna you, you're gonna have a rotation there, and, and depending on, you know the series like you know you're going to see guys spell each other I, I think for ultimately this is a group that they're going to play a lot of receivers just like they're going to play a lot of running backs but when it gets crunch time it, you know if it's you know it, if it's even if it's one of the lesser guys times to go they're going to stick with the guys that they trust you know sure. I, I that's how I feel about it like I you know I think you know, the Cedric Tillman's going to play because he's smart and he's proven he can catch the football. Um, you know, and that's something that you know, maybe two years ago he wasn't doing. Um, Bayless Jones is someone they trust. Jalen Hyatt is someone that they trust. You know, that can Jimmy Callaway or Jimmy Holiday earn that trust? Can Javante Payton, as a first-year guy, you know, a one-year guy, how quickly can he earn the trust? to be a guy in crunch time. I really feel like they'll lot rely on their main guys in crunch time, but through the course of the game, you're going to see a lot of, a, a lot of receivers, you know, get snaps. It may be six snaps. It may be 20 snaps, but I, I think you're going to see a, a pretty healthy rotation. It just will be, I guess, dictated by, you know, time and place. And then, you know, who do they really want on the field the most? Yeah, and some of that's a feel. If they see a, a defense gas, they're just going to hold off on a rotation and just keep going yeah. with what they got. I mean, it, you know, a lot of that is is the feel of where you are with things. So, um, and again, I haven't seen it. I haven't. I've not watched a, a UCF game uh, coached by Josh Heupel to go, okay, well, that's how they do it. You, you know, I, I, I haven't watched a, enough of last year of a all twenty two view to know how much they've rotated somebody or they haven't rotated somebody. But again, I, I think it's dictated just by flow of the game more than more than anything else. All right, a uh, couple more here quickly. Um, regarding the investigation, is death penalty on the table? Do you think? Absolutely not. I don't think anybody in the NCAA. <laughs> Who asked that? Um, Cozy, Cozy. I, I don't think any, I don't think the NCAA is ever handing out the death penalty again. I, I think that's off the table for everybody as a part of any NCAA investigation. Tennessee, obviously. Um, wants to self-impose some stuff. I think that that's something that they would like to get done in the summer and see if they can get this thing moved past them uh, pretty quickly and 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 move on. But but we'll see if that that's the case. Um, I, I mean, I, that I, happens. you know, I think we're all in agreement that Tennessee's kind of hoping that by you know offering up the sacrificial lamb of removing everybody that was here previously and. And, and doing things the right way and including in the NCAA and letting them being involved and all that is going to give them um, a nice fluffy pillow to land on. Um, we'll see if that's the case. You never know what the NCAA I, and how they go about things. But I mean, like, you know, the NCAA has no leg to stand on when it comes to doing anything like death penalty wise. I mean, they, they don't do anything to Arizona. LSU, North Carolina, I mean, you can go right down the list. It's, it's I mean, been they, 40 years, not, right? Yeah, I mean, they just it, they need ten, the NCAA. You know, I'm sure looks at Tennessee and says you get you got to do better. But at the same time, they need Tennessee to be good. They need Tennessee sure. to be to be a, a factor in all sports across the board. I don't I don't think Greg Sankey is letting that letting that slide. No, and again, the, the NCAA is not doing that to, to I mean, anybody. I don't think it's on the table anyway. But Sankey yeah. wouldn't. Be, all right, we're out of here. Yeah, absolutely. All right, two questions, and then we're out the door. AP, enjoyed your interview with Andrew Page. Is he going to camp at Tennessee? Do you think he'll run well enough to get SEC looks? Um, I think he'll camp at Tennessee. Um, you know, I'll be interested to see how well he runs. I mean, I, I watch him on film, but, I mean, that's hard to tell how well he runs on film. I do know this, you know, going against some, some decent DBs at some seven-on-seven seven stuff, he has had a tendency to get behind – the secondaries and stuff. Now, granted, that's seven on seven, but it, you can learn how, you know, how well a kid runs in, in that realm. So um, it wouldn't surprise me at all if he runs well. And I think you'll end up getting some looks. I, you know, if I'm a, you know, Mississippi State or Vanderbilt, I, I, I'm for sure 
you know, getting him to camp and giving him a hard look. Yeah, I think he's really fast. A great looking prospect who's just so raw. I mean, he just he's such he's so learning the game because he didn't play for a while. It was about basketball for him and you know, all this all that. But I mean, frame wise, the you know, athletically, he looks really good. It's just he's got to learn how to play receiver. And I think he's come a long way there, but I think he's very still remains a really unpolished player at this point. And again, Austin, he's in an offense that not going to get a ton of that. They're not going to throw it around the lot a ton, you know, at beach and, unless they do some really, you know, changing what they do offensively. So I think summer camps are going to be really important for him. Um, and I think a lot of people are intrigued by him because they're just not sure exactly what he is or how good he can be because he's just raw learning the position at this point. All right. Last question comes from Hunter. Uh, are there any UT guys currently in the portal that could return to UT in football or basketball? Uh, my response to that is no. I don't. I'm not aware of anyone that would who's currently in the portal that hadn't landed a home that would potentially come back. I mean, I, this the chances of this are extremely slim in my mind. But I, I mean, I, I would say it's possible that Anasiki could come back. I don't think he would play or be a factor. But I just know that that's one guy that hasn't found a home, and I don't think there's much interest in. So if he just wanted to come back and you know, be a body and, and, you know, work on some graduate hours. I would, I would say that's a possibility, but that's the only one I would think of. Yeah, and I don't know of anybody on the football side, Austin, do you? No, I mean, most everybody's found a home or they just don't want back. Yeah, and, <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly. And we'll see if there's anybody else jumping in the portal in the coming days as well. And before we go, however, anybody, anybody listening on the board on the GQ, you can, you can DM me. But I've got 97 rolls of toilet paper that I will trade for 10 gallons of 87 octane fuel. Well, <laughs> but what about Chick Fil A sauce? What, where's that factor in? I mean, I'm not, know, I'm they, not a Chick Fil A sauce guy. No, no Polynesian it, sauce. I mean, it, no, but it it is it, that 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 is the stop that's inside Rob's circle of two miles around his house <laughs> that he's willing to travel out. I'm, I'm, just, I'm a Chick Fil A guy. I'm just straight up no no sauce, no, no sauce, no sauce guy. Just right. a sandwich. So we so we've got toilet paper trading for gas, but we're not interested in sauce. But if somebody's got some lumber, might be willing to make a trade there as well. So um, that's the latest marketplace. Saturday, Saturday, our version of the Saturday swap at your local radio station on the VolQuest.com <laughs> Blue Water Climate Control Mailbag Podcast. That's going to do it for this edition. For Rob Lewis and Austin Price, I'm Brent Hubs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great uh, Thursday, everybody.